Hello, as I wait to be able to turn to Guadalcanal for boots on the ground filming, I've created an episode I hope you enjoy. This episode will focus on the wounding of Marine Corps legend Louis B. Chesty Puller. Puller is the most decorated Marine in history and served for 37 years. He was well known as a frontline combat leader and fought in many skirmishes in Haiti, Nicaragua, the Pacific Campaign, and Korea. During that entire time, he was only ever wounded once in combat, and that was at Guadalcanal. I'll set the stage. Um, this particular engagement or battle is known as the Coley Point uh, Action or Coley Point Battle, or the Battle of Tateri in, in some circles. Uh, during this battle, Marines from the 7th Marine Regiment and Army soldiers from the 164th Infantry Regiment under tactical commands of General Rupertus and Seabury attacked a concentration of Japanese Army troops, most of whom belonged to the 230th Infantry Regiment uh, commanded by Colonel Soji. Colonel Soji's troops had marched to the Coley Point area after their failed assault on the U.S. defenses during a battle for Henderson Field in late October 42. If you remember these guys, uh, the 230th Regiment was formed the right wing who wasn't really uh, engaged in the battle. The Marines received intelligence reports that the Japanese were building up on the eastern flank. At the same time, uh, Vandegrift had a large offensive committed in the Point Cruz area and uh, to the Cucumbana. So d having reports of Japanese on his eastern flanks and especially um, landing additional Japanese reinforcements uh, posed a bit of a, a problem for Vandegrift. So he sent his 2nd Battalion, the 7th Marines under um, Lieutenant Colonel Hanneken eastward to the Cully Point area to investigate. There the Marines uh, located the 230th Japanese regiments and also additional reinforcements had been landed, roughly about a reinforced battalion. Uh, the Marines had thought a uh, larger force had been uh, landed there, so they committed further uh, forces, including Puller's 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines, and two battalions of the 164th uh, Infantry Regiment. You will note on the map that once the, um, the Army and the Marines were committed, there at Culley Point to the top of the, the mount there, what they tried to do uh, was to pin the Japanese in this area and try to envelop them, especially with the army units coming from the south. But uh, they moved a bit slow and the Japanese were able to uh, elude that trap and they moved to the uh, east into a pocket. And you'll see the Japanese pocket there in red. And that was at the Gavava Creek area. So the Marines were committed to surrounding this pocket and destroying it. Here's an enlargement of the, the map. Uh, it's actually a pretty good map. I uh, go to this one all the time. So you'll notice the 2nd Battalion, the 164th, and the 7th Marines uh, went by amphibious assault to land at Gavava Creek. You have 17, which is Puller's Battalion, up the top there, and then the Army below them, and then 27 was on the other side trying to form that pocket. Well, Puller's Battalion was marching in two columns. He had one uh, to the interior in the jungle, and he was with one infantry company with his command group. They were just inside the tree line moving uh, down the beach, uh, heading toward the uh, opening of the creek. The next few pictures are an actual uh, map uh, drawn during the time of the battle. And also an aerial photo of Gavava Creek area in June of 42, American Reconnaissance, and some actual photos of the creek mouth itself from the Japanese in the American point of view. You can see from these photos uh, that it's a tidal basin, um, so it ebbs and flows the depths of the, the creek itself, but it's generally full of water um, all year long. You'll notice on that last photo how thick the terrain is on one side the U.S. lines, the other side the Japanese lines. And you can see why on the, one of the evenings that the majority of Japanese were able to escape uh, through that thickness and left just a rear guard of about 450 Japanese. This next part I'll be reading from uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Hoffman's uh, great, uh, I think, definitive book on Puller, his biography, uh, entitled Chesty. Uh, I'll read straight from it um, concerning the wounding of, of Puller. 
The Marines had only minor contacts during the morning. The thick vegetation slowed 17 and 27, gradually pulled out in front of its sister battalion. Eventually, Pulu's command group migrated into the beach where the going was easier for men carrying heavy radios and large reels of telephone wire. Around noon, the Japanese opened up on this lucrative target with a field gun and machine guns located east of the Gavava. The initial fuselage savage 17 CP, which was just behind the lead infantry elements and only a few hundred yards from the creek. Before the clerks, communicators, and corpsmen could scramble to safety, nearly 20 men were down. One of them was Puller, hit once in the arm and several times in his left leg and foot. His long run of good fortune in the face of enemy fire finally had come to an end. I'll continue on reading from Hoffman's book uh, about the wounding of Puller. It just shows you what type of a leader and a man this uh, Chesty was. Chesty's wounds were significant, but not immediately life-threatening. As battalion reached to the fire and attacked, he remained firmly in command. Another of the casualties in the CP was the artillery observer, so Puller got on the field telephone to request fire support. To his dismay, the line had been cut by the Japanese barrage. With much of his communication sections knocked out, he crawled out into the beach and repaired the break. Still in the open to obtain a field of view, he rang up the 10th Marines and called in a mission. The pack howitzers were not in range. Puller moved back into the tree line and tried to arrange air support, but none was available. Meanwhile, his men moved forward on increasing fire until they gained the rear bank of Gavaga Creek, where they dug in for the evening. Kelly, the XO, was with the rifle companies. When he learned that Chesty was a casualty, he called the CP and asked if he should move back there to assist in running a battalion. Puller told him to stay up forward where he was needed the most. The artillery finally was ready to fire late in the afternoon, and Puller moved him to the beach to spot the fall of the shells and call in corrections. And still reading from Hoffman's book, this is classic Puller here. Landing craft came up the coast that evening to remove 175's five dead and 26 wounded. A doctor inspected Puller, filled out a casualty tag, and told him he would be sent to the rear. Bloody bandages on his arm and leg, notwithstanding, Chesty rose up and shouted, Evacuate me, hell. Take that tag and label a baller with it. I'll remain in command. His reaction came not from mere bravado, but from a genuine concern about the fate of his outfit. Casualties and disease had greatly reduced his officer's compliment, and the next senior leader in the battalion was Kelly, a junior captain. The strength and capability of the Japanese were unknown, but they had artillery. He expected they would launch a night counterattack. In his opinion, the situation was far from good and had no officer of sufficient experience to take over the command. As the night wore on, however, Puller's leg stiffened, he realized his ability to run things was severely handicapped. When Sims, which is the regimental commander, called after midnight to say that Major John E. Weber, a company commander in 37, would report to Sim Commander 17, Chesty accepted the news without complaint. So the other officer arrived about uh, 07 in the morning, took over command. Um, Puller's troops put him in a landing craft. If I remember right, he refused to be carried. He walked, or basically um, stumbled into it, but he remained on his feet. And uh, once he arrived at Lunga Point, they took him to Division Field Hospital. Uh, he had several holes in him, possibly many as seven, but the doctor was able to remove all the metal except for one piece, which was embedded deep in his thigh uh, near the bone. Uh, the doctors told him he's going to have to be evacuated to Ireland, to, back to New Caledonia. Uh, he said, nope, he's going to stay with the men and stay near the sound of the guns, according to Hoffman. And this is what uh, it was reported that Puller said. Having been raised on stories of Confederate veterans walking around with enough iron in them to start a junkyard, he actually may have been pleased at the prospect of having his own permanent souvenir of war. And if you um, <clears throat> do some further study on Puller, you'll notice that during a um, battle of Peleliu, uh, this wound came back to haunt him. So um, he was fairly um, suffering from that wound, and it was later removed after that battle from his Guadalcanal wounds. This completes the wounding of um, Chesty Puller. Uh, if you've got any more ideas and enjoy the content, just leave um, some comments. Um, I'll have a look at them and see what we can do for you. Thank you for uh, watching.